Hi, Cloud. Okay, good. Okay, so I want to dedicate this class for a lot of Rafua Shalema. So Ingrid Mann from our shul is really not doing well. And her name is Yafa Bat Yochevet. So if anybody wants to write that down to pray for her. So she's having a lot, like very debilitating. We don't know what it is. She's at Toronto General. They're doing a whole bunch of tests on her, but she's like really losing her mobility and ability to move and her arms and her legs and everything. So it's really something. So we wish her Rafua Shalema and our like beloved Chaya Yehudis, Gitol Bas Miriam Devora, Rafua Shalema, and also mm -hmm. for Ina Bas Shulamit, a Rafua Shalema, and for anybody else out there who needs a Rafua. Okay, so that's why learning Amuna is so important because I was talking to Sue before, like before we were just saying, like it's really tough, right? It's very tough to keep hearing a lot of. Um, bad news or illness or all the things that are going on and you know then you got to pick up your Tehillim and you're trying to pray for these people and you're trying to really feel that what you're doing is making a difference and I just want to say it is I just really want to say that and I know how hard it is so when we look at these six constant mitzvahs the word constant is there for a reason why because it's a constant struggle that's what Hashem is telling you up front. Okay, so he's not saying, I take all your amuna for granted. And what's the big deal, ladies and gentlemen? Why can't you believe in me? Because Hashem is saying, I understand. This is a constant battle. Why is it such a constant battle? I want to hear from you guys. Why do you feel like, you know, working on your amuna is such a constant battle? What stands in its way? Somebody Sahara. Okay. okay, so like very good. The eight Saharas. What's the eight Sahara always doing? Doubt. Putting doubt in our minds. Okay, beautiful. Okay, Sandy's very right. Okay, so the word suffake means doubt. And we say that, you know, it's the gematria, the same numerical value of the worst enemy of the Jewish people called a malek, right? So it's always putting all kinds of doubt. What's the doubt that it makes you think about? Like I'm being real. Okay. What's like what makes you doubt? You know, so so and so is getting sick. Like, what's that my problem? Like, why does it make me doubt? Because so I think you battle to see that it's for the good. Right. We can't always see the good. It, feel, it doesn't feel good. Right, right. Okay, so, and, and it's very real. Like, you know, you see the person in pain. You can't understand. They're young people. You love them. They're good people. They look like, you know, they're suffering. And meanwhile, who's prospering? The wicked good people. Yeah, like there's a lot of wicked people out there that you like scratch your head and you go like, why are they the billionaire taking down the world with dark money? Like, you're like, what's going on here? Like, you know, why them? Why are they? So this is tough. Do you live in a world that believes in a God? You see a lot of people who walk around all day long and are completely godless. And you can explain a lot about God to them. And this is what they say. I don't care. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, okay, so there is a God. I don't care. Like, you know, it's a big one. So why do we care? Like, these are big Because questions. we believe in Hashem. And why? Why? Because we know nothing is random. Beautiful. <laughs> So all of these thoughts that you're telling me, I believe in Hashem and nothing is random. You got to work. You've studied, right? You've looked into this. That's what the six constant mitzvahs is trying to tell you. The first one is saying, Anochi Hashem Elokecha Asher Sicha May Eretz Mitzrayim. And it doesn't say it once or twice in the Torah. And it doesn't ask you just, you know, arbitrarily, yeah, think about it some days. It's constant, okay? Six things that you have to remember every day. One of them is that the Almighty God took you out of Egypt. You say the Shema, you talk about going out of Egypt. Every prayer, there's Tehillims, every single thing revolves around taking you out of Egypt. What's the biggest holiday of the year? Yeah. Pesach, okay, what are you supposed to do on Pesach? Remember your tears. Remember the speaking out of Egypt. You have to feel, you have to emotionally buy into the program. This isn't about like going to Sobeys and going, like it's very interesting because I don't know and I hope Hashem will help us, but they're really um, forecasting a lot of 
empty shelves for Pesach. Like, I don't know if you're going to get kishka and pizza and all the other stuff we got for Pesach all these years. I don't know if this is going to be the year of the brand new chocolate cake and the noodles for Pesach. Like, I'm being honest. Like, they really are forecasting that there could be a lot of shortages. If anybody was in the States recently, right, if you went to Florida and you looked into some places, there are shortages. Okay, so this isn't going to be this Pesach, every Pesach throughout history, do you understand what we're really doing? We're reading <coughs> this event. And you, what's the whole focus of this Seder? What's the Seder really about? The big, big part of the Seder, biggest part of the Seder. Tell it to your children. Yes. Okay, beautiful, Sandy. Tell it to your children. It's the only way that we're going to pass on this history. Like, if you were looking, like, at the, the whole Holocaust story like it's scary there is i don't know if there's so few holocaust survivors left you know if this is not really cemented like any demented person can come up and tell you this thing never ever happened there's people already who've been saying it already the whole time so all the more so what's hashem saying i took you out of egypt why was that the biggest thing that we have to believe in Hashem. Remember we said, like, we could have said something big, like, I created the world, but instead it's, I took you out of Egypt. What's the purpose of that as the big, you know, piece of evidence that we hold on to? Why that more than anything else? I am the one who, who took you out of Egypt. I am the one who is going to be the backbone of everything, even okay. though you think you're not. Okay, okay, okay. So I am the one personally, okay? You are going back in your Jewish generation and your Jewish roots. Do you understand? And every year you reenact this event. You know, my great Bobby told us, and we're crazy. We turn our house upside down. We do everything that the Torah tells us, which is wacko, right? Like there is no chametz and there's no this. And then we have all these rituals and everybody does the exact same thing all over the world. And every Jew is remembering. And what was so amazing about being taken out of Egypt, it's the birth of the Jewish nation and came forth the Torah, which is what? Today, what's everybody talking about in politics? Turn on your radio in politics, okay? Go on to the anything conservative out there. What are they saying that we need to save and preserve? What are they worried about? Democracy is falling and so is... Freedom. So is Jewish, Judo-Christian philosophy. Do you understand? What does Judo-Christian philosophy mean? The Ten Commandments. The whole world bought in to the Ten Commandments. Do we understand that? So it could not have been a simple reality because think about this. People don't like the Jews. Why would I pick up from them? Like I'm being real. Like keep your Ten Commandments, keep your everything and stay away from us. If you ask the world, that's what they would love to see. Uh, like really, right? We, we talked about on Shabbos, you know, all the um, racist acts, the highest are committed against Jews, even in 2022. All right. So you, you need to appreciate this. So Anochi Hashem Lokecha Sherhod Say Sicha Me'eretz Mitzrayim is stay awake. Stay awake. Stay awake. This is a real story. It's not made up. All right. So Shem is saying, I know it's constantly going to be a fight because inside of you, just like Karen said, is that little speck of doubt. Now, why is half of the world right now saying, let's just get rid of this whole judo Christian garbage. Like, what do we need God for? Like half the world is telling you religion is the absolute stupidest thing that ever existed. What's their real motivation? They want to do what they want to do. They don't ah, want to answer beautiful. to anybody. Yeah, they don't want to answer to anyone. Okay, I want to be a girl today, a boy tomorrow. I want to live with my dog, my pet, my whatever I want to live with. It's none of your business, okay? I want to, what's it called? Grab and smash and grab. I want to do what I want, okay? I don't need any uh, over me, right? So Yetzirah is always looking for the easy way out. The soul is always looking for what? What's the soul the, want? The hard way out. The hard way. The neshama. The neshama. The neshama wants what? It's willing to put the work in, but what does it want? Eternity. 
connection to Hashem. Connection to Hashem. Why do we want that? Okay, what, why would we fight? We don't want a world with murder, like Jews, like, why do we fight? You know, we're, we're going to collect, you know, food for the poor and we're going to give clothes to the poor and we're going to do this. Like, we're always like the mitzvah, you know, the mitzvah mobile. Why are we always driving the mitzvah mobile? Tikkun olam. Yeah, tikkun olam, because it drives us. You're driving that mobile, like the mitzvah mobile, because it drives you. Nothing in the end fills you more than doing the right thing. Okay. Really, when you finish, like you know, you you know, when you finish eating, okay, okay, like, okay, okay, you got your choice here. Like, you know, you want your uh, cake, right? And your Yetzirah tells you, you deserve it, you need it. Meanwhile, you know, you have high blood pressure. You know, you really, really shouldn't be eating this stuff, okay? So the, the cake is, the Yetzirah is looking at the cake and telling you, it's so good. Yummy, yum, 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 yum. You should deserve it, blah, 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 right? Right? And then you eat up the whole cake. Now tell me the truth. How do you really feel after you finished eating it? Right. Now, what about if you didn't eat it? You said, you know what, Yetzirah, you're right. Like, looks good, but it ain't good for me. I'm turning the page. I'm going to do something else instead. Okay, then how would you feel? How do you feel? Great, amazing. So, so this, Lior, yeah. So this really is the reality. Okay, so you will have a constant battle with Amuna. So you, what's what's Hashem telling you? What's what are we all realizing? It's a mitzvah. Now I'm going to tell you something about a mitzvah that blew my mind. Okay, so I love to you know always ask people, what's the definition of a mitzvah? What does mitzvah mean? Okay, and if you don't know it, I'm going to send you a nasty letter. Okay, so what does it mean? What does mitzvah mean? Connection to God. What? A connection to God. Yes. Okay, but let me explain something with the nature of a mitzvah, okay, so which is very important. You're right, Lior is 100%. The word mitzvah means connector, but every mitzvah, like this one, six constant mitzvahs, believing in Hashem, a constant mitzvah comes with tension. Do you believe me? Like every mitzvah comes with tension. Yes. Okay, good. Like I see Amita and, and, um, and Jody, the shaking their head. What's the tension? What's the tension that comes with every single mitzvah? I don't care which mitzvah it is. There's an effort. What? There's an effort. There's an effort. What's the tension? What's the effort? The Yitzhahora is trying to get back at you. Exactly. Okay. So every mitzvah comes with this choice. I do it. Don't do it. <laughs> okay. Do it. Don't do it. All right. Do it. Don't do it. All right. So every mitzvah, including this mitzvah, because otherwise, if there's no effort in the relationship, there is no relationship. You know, like when people get married, like the worst thing, uh, like, uh, men can be very stupid. Okay. So I'll tell you a very stupid thing men say to their wives, things like, really, when I think about it, I probably could have married anybody. Okay. <laughs> Anybody ever hear that smart line? <laughs> like, like that's how husband. Like, I don't want to make you feel bad, but really, when I think about, it, I think I could have married anybody. <laughs> okay. Dumb. Don't ever say that. Okay, because when you say that, what happens to the relationship? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So good. It goes I mean, down. Yeah, it goes down. <laughs> why? Why, Sue? Why? Because you're not appreciating what yes, you've got and you're looking yes, for something better. Yes. You want to be appreciated. You want to feel chosen. If I chose you, then that means I want you. If it really didn't matter, if it was Tom, Dick, or Harry, then who cares? Then you really have no intrinsic value. So every mitzvah, Hashem is saying, you, you're going to have to choose me again and again and again, and again, and then again. Do you see what's going on? And that's why this mitzvah of Amuna is constant, right? So it's just important for us to know because, you know, when you're like, you know, you go on vacation, you see the sun and the ocean and whatever, and you're like, wow, marabu masech Hashem. Oh, the things that you do are so glorious of course there is a god and then you come home and you hear this one's service and that one's service and your own service 
And then you're like, oh, wait a minute. Ma Rabu Ma Seth Hashem, your deeds are so wondrous. What the heck's going on? Right? So now you see how you have to keep working on it. Okay. So you will hear some people say, you know, if God is so amazing and he did Harsinai and so many people have doubts, why doesn't he just do another Harsinai? You know that Hashem said, like, it's a big one, and I want you to explain it to me. God said, I showed my cards once. I'm never showing them again. There will never be another Harsinai again. Why? Like, if you're, like, think about it. Like, why, like, why is God saying once is enough? I did it once. I gave you the holiday of Pesach. You have a mitzvah. You work on it. You look at the hand, my hand in history. You look and see if what I said isn't true, right? But I'm not playing the game again. So why is that? Because God doesn't want people to get used to it. Ah. You do what you want. You'll do the bad choice. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. And I do another. And I'll do a little mix. I'll yeah, do another, another little miracle, miracle. And then we'll see what happens. So I do want to tell you something about miracles, okay? It's, it's not so simple. Like, you know, when people say, oh, if God just made a miracle, then I would do what's right. How true is that? No, it isn't. So they show you in the Nach, like this was such a telling part. Like you know, anybody, where's Sue? She's going to know this. And you better help me with the name of the king. Yeravam wasn't married to Izevel. Sue, am I right? You have to unmute. Hang on. Sorry, I have to unmute. You rather no, was married. Achav was married Achav. to Isabel. Okay, so I, I thought it was Rachav, and I couldn't remember. Okay, so Achav. Okay, so it was like the most wicked king and queen in the Jewish. And this was in the Northern Kingdom or Southern Kingdom? Northern Kingdom. Northern Kingdom. Okay, so which means Yehuda, right? Like the real deal. No, no. Israel. Israel. Okay, good. You see? <laughs> 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 it's good jennifer's here it's good <laughs> anyway okay so in the southern kingdom so this is the 10 tribes they were terrible okay they were big worshipers of idols they're going off completely away from god and god sends the great prophet elio navi who happens to come to our houses on Pesach. okay so elio navi who's supposed to be the forebringer of mashiach okay the so he comes he, and he goes on to Har Carmel. You know, if you go to Israel, they'll show you this. This is like a real site in Israel. So I remember we went with Ken Spiro. Okay, so we're on Har Carmel and there were two um, altars, all right? So one was from what we call the Baal. The Baal is like this terrible idol worshiper group. And one was Elio and Navis. And what they were gonna say is everyone's gonna put sacrifices and their God should come and um, light the, the altar and take the sacrifice. Okay, so Baal's like, they were very smart. They actually had guys in the, in the um, uh, altar itself hiding inside that they were gonna you know, light the flame to prove that the Baal was the superior God you know, or was equal to Hashem, either way. Anyway, so what happens? Of course, Eliyahu, nothing's happening. It doesn't work for them. It's all you know, bogus. And he's like making fun of them. He keeps yelling, come on, call your God. Maybe he's in the bathroom. That's why he's not here. Oh, maybe he's sleeping. That's why he's not here. Anyway, ends up big miracle. Eliyahu Navi, Eliyahu Navi even pours water on his altar and he shows like in a snap Hashem comes and all the Jews are like, what did they say? Um, Ain od milvado, Hashem hu alakim, God is the, you know, Hashem, the God of mercy is the God of judgment. That's what they're screaming out, okay? Now Izevel and Achab are burning up, okay? Because they don't want the Jews to recognize God. They want their idol to be worshipped. Why? Because then people will worship them, okay? That's, that's, this is what this is all about, right? It's not because they don't believe in Hashem, it's they don't want Hashem. So what happens, you know, this miracle looks like the Jewish people are all fine. Eliyahu was so happy, goes home, you know, wow, what a wonderful night, everything worked out great. Gets a, a letter from Isabel. She says, tomorrow morning, I'm coming to murder you. So the rabbis ask, why did she wait? Why didn't she murder him on the spot? I mean, She's going to murder him tomorrow. She could have murdered him right then and there. So what's the answer? Because on the spot, the Jews were inspired. 
by tomorrow morning, the inspiration would wane. You see what goes Even on? Even Ahab was inspired and the yeah. sugar for that. Yeah. yeah, for that night. But that's it. And then by the next day, the inspiration is gone. Yes. And that's what I mean. So here's where Hashem is telling you, it's got to be a constant mitzvah and it will be a constant struggle. So in some ways, you know what? That's a breath of fresh air because sometimes you wonder what's wrong with me. Anybody ever feel that way? Like, what's wrong with me? Like, you know, I'm a Rebetzin or I've been going to shul for all these years or I'm this person who's a Balchuva and I gave up everything and I really believe in God. So now you have to know, you don't have to feel bad about it. Hashem is saying, this is the ultimate mitzvah. This is your mitzvah of all mitzvahs and you're going to have to do the work, okay? So I wanted to show you- Going back- in your class a few lines. Okay. You said, why, why is there only one Sinai and not more? Yeah. Which is basically because if there were more Sinais, then okay. it would be a problem for people to understand that it was a one-time thing and everyone's doing the same thing. If there's two, then there's controversy. Yeah, that could be two, 100%. Okay, so I want to share my screen with you because somebody sent me this and I thought it was really beautiful and I want us to discuss it. So I'm just kind of looking for it. Okay, so I think that's it. No, that is not it. Where could it be? Okay, wait one minute. Yeah, this is it. Okay, so I'm going to write share screen, right? And then I want us to read this together. And then I want us to understand, um, like to sort of discuss it. Okay, so here is share screen. Uh, let me see if I got the right thing. Hold on, sorry. No, no. okay, hold on one minute. Okay, I'm trying again, sorry, just give me this minute. Okay, now share screen. Okay. Is it this one? Yeah. Okay. So do you see this now? Wait, share. Okay. Wait. Do yeah. Do you see this now? Yes. 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 Oh, perfect. Okay. <laughs> so, all right. So here, so Jen, you're there. Yeah. Okay. So I want you to read this. Jen, can you read this first paragraph for us? Today? Me? Yeah. Sure. Okay. Thanks so much. Um, today, the world marks International Holocaust Remembrance Day. This morning in the German parliament, the Bundestag, the speaker of the Knesset, Mickey Levy, spoke in Hebrew in front of all the assembled members. Directly in front of him sat the president of Germany and the chancellor of Germany. Alongside them sat Ing Aufbacher, one of the few remaining survivors of the Shoah, who also delivered remarks. Okay. You know what? Maybe you'll continue reading. You continue reading. Okay. okay. At Thank the you. end of his address, is it Mickey or Mikey? Mickey Levy. Yeah, Mickey, Mickey Levy, Levy broke down in tears as he recited Mourner's Kaddish. As he sobbed at the podium, he was comforted by the speaker of the Bundestag. When the ceremony concluded, it was clear that Ing Auerbacher, now physically frail, would need help walking out of the chamber. The president of Germany stepped forward and held onto one arm, and then the chancellor of Germany stepped forward and took her other arm. The three of them walked out together, an elderly Holocaust survivor being supported on either side by the president and chancellor of Germany. If you had told them back in 45 that one day there would be a sovereign state of Israel and that the speaker of the Knesset would come and speak in Hebrew before the German nation, they would not have believed you. If you had told them back in 1945 that one day the entire Bundestag would rise to their feet while Kaddish was recited for the six million, by a Jewish leader overcome with emotion, they would not have believed you. If you had told them back in 1945 that the president and the chancellor of Germany, representing the nation that tried to wipe us from the face of the planet, would together help one frail Jewish woman walk, they would have been astonished. But all of that happened today. When the darkness of anti-Semitism descends, let us remember this. They may threaten us, they may wound us, they may terrify us and murder us, but they will never defeat us. They will only defeat their own evil mission. One day their descendants too will humbly help an old Jewish woman as she walks proudly through the halls of power. Wow. Isn't that unbelievable? It's a true story. 
Can you send that to me? <laughs> yeah, can you send it to everyone. I'm going to send Thank it to you. everyone, okay, because it's really incredible. So when you look at this story, okay, so now here comes the concept of Amuna. Do you see what I'm saying? This is all Amuna. This is all a story of Amuna. Do you see? Where you see that nothing possible or all the bad and everything horrible, like you're like, what, what? Like, you know, you're standing in 1945 and then you see like what we always talk about, like how Hashem sees beyond the time and the place. You're looking through that narrow keyhole and then you see what the end really is. And all of this, everything you're reading is really a step towards Mashiach. When you read this, then you can believe that there will be one day a Mashiach. I'm being honest, all right? Like the possibility of any of this is statistically completely improbable. I'm being real. All right. Statistically, completely improbable. The reality is that you could have written this about Jewish history about 100 times. Like, you know, if you would have gone back to any of the points in Jewish history, right, the Cossacks and the this and the that, and you would say, well, if they would have looked 100 years and saw a Jewish, do you know what I mean? Any of this, right, would be completely unbelievable to anybody. So in a way, when you have to fight your Yetzirah when it comes to Amuna. Part of fighting it is to go back and in your own personal life, I'm not talking always, nationally, there's no doubt. The Jewish people's survival is a complete miracle, a complete promise from Hashem, completely unheard of. There is no other nation like us in the world. It was very interesting. My daughter um, went to San Diego. She got to meet, who is that psychologist who survived the Holocaust? She's very famous. She was a dancer before the war. She ended up dancing in front of Mengele and that saved her life. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? E Edith Ega. Yeah, Edith Ega. <laughs> So Goldie, my Goldie, Edith Ager is very good friends with, um, with my, my, my Machatunin, okay? So she came over to speak to Goldie, like, she, like they're just friends. So Goldie got a chance to speak to her for like an hour. She said it was like unbelievable. She's 96, I think also, Kanai Nahara. Anyway, so when she was talking to her, she said something interesting. She said like she found it very interesting that the Jewish people were born as slaves, the nation of Jews came from a very horrible history and a long history of slaves. Like it was awful, right? Terrible. And she said, yet the Jewish people never ever used the victim card. First of all, the world doesn't even let us. Even if we wanted to use the victim card, we never could. And I, I don't think the world would let us use the victim card. I really don't. But I'm just saying it's like really an incredible reality. So Shem knew what he was doing. Should I mean? But when you're looking at it, it's it's very, very like hard to swallow all these realities. And in hindsight, you know, you know everybody always says, what is it? Uh, hindsight is 2020. Yes, after the fact, you know, it's a lot easier to have this quality called Amuna, a constant fight with Amuna. But in your own personal life, it's like each and every one of us has to look at all the good that Hashem gave us. Like it was so interesting. I really have to tell you that I found this like such a shkafa practice. Like the rabbi was listening to, was listening to looking at different things. I was listening to this rabbi, I think his name was Rabbi Alpern from England, for, who works for URA. Of all things that he said that I found was so interesting, he said, you have to realize how much Hashem is in your life. There is no other God. So for instance, for instance, you take for granted, in your mind, you choose to raise your hand, right? And then what happens? Hashem allows you to raise it. You really don't have the power on your own whatsoever. And I don't think we think about it. Then when you hear about Nebuch, all these wonderful, beautiful women who are not well right now, who are having exactly that issue, like and we took it all for granted. Like you almost think like, not only do you have to believe that there is only one Hashem, you also have to believe that there is no other God. And unfortunately, we sometimes get very confused and we kind of think we are the other God. Do you know what I mean? Like we can do it, you know, and if Hashem helps, that's great. <laughs> but really, you know, it's us. So really, like he brought out a very interesting point. Like he said, who's making your heart pump? Like, what's the difference if I have a job or I don't have a job? If my heart's not pumping, it ain't going to make no difference. So all the things that we take a lot of, like, pride in, you have to remember where the real power source is coming. Right? And then, like, you know, sometimes you look at a world, like, sometimes I look at the world, 
And I find it so hard, like, because, you know, all of us, I, I believe here, you have a very, um, what's the word, a, a strong God consciousness. I'm going to put stop share for right now, okay? Just because I want to see you guys. Okay, perfect. You have a strong God consciousness. What does that mean? What does it mean when I say you have a strong God consciousness? The aware that friendship is around the loves. Yeah, like you're living your life kind, you know, trying to keep tuning in to that channel. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, so, you know, give me an example, like in your day, like I'm just being real, like give me your exa an example in your day, like where you're working on that Amuna and you're trying to like plug in, like, you know, you're, you're turning the, you're turning the channel there. So give me examples. All the mitzvahs. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you when <laughs> so you wake up, you go, okay, I'm, I'm gonna dub in, I'm gonna do this. Okay, fine. What else? Like, what else? Like, how do you even think it comes into my business and buys from us? I'm so grateful. I'm not gonna go anywhere and they come to me. All right, Leora, that's like outstanding. Okay, so we, okay, I'm gonna repeat what she said and then Sandy, I wanna ask. So, not sure everybody heard, but Leora's saying like she has a business. Okay, you know, every customer that comes in, like, that's a gift. You know, what can Leora really do? You know, like Leora, how much can you do to really advertise amazing donuts? You can only yeah. do so much, right? So anybody who calls or comes or whatever, it really is a miracle. Okay, it's not a joke because there's other donuts and other bakeries and other convenience and other this and other that. And punk, they decide to come to you. So Sandy, how do you like tap into your consciousness? Well, I'm going to go on the other side. I'm going to say I'm driving to work and I get every red, red light and I look up and say, why? <laughs> I like that though, but that's, that's on it. It's real. It's real. But that's it's, but it's all, all day long. Anything that happens and yes. it's bad, anything that happens, I always either thank or question. Right. You thank or question, or you have a dialogue or like, come on, can I get one green light? <laughs> okay. but, well, there's also when you're in a very difficult situation in yeah. a hospital, and yeah. you suddenly realize that you can't raise your hand without the help of God. Right, right. beautiful, beautiful, Dina. Okay, and jo Jody, I think you want to say something. What I was just to gonna say, you know, when you when you finally when you when you're sitting there with young kids and you finally get get, get told that they can go back to school and all of a sudden it's a vacation. <laughs> <laughs> And you're sitting there going, Hashem, like, what do you want from me? I have to rest. Leave me alone. Like, like, I don't understand. Please help me. And okay. and and the girls are, are <laughs> like just just going nuts. You know? Okay, so this is amazing. Okay, but this is amazing. Okay, so you you live with God consciousness. I know this sounds funny, but that's Amuna. Amuna is, you know what, Hashem? you're the one who did this <laughs> okay not in a mean way i don't want to complain or maybe i do you are the one who put me in this position what is so good about knowing that what is so good about what follows after you are the one you can get me out of it ah okay beautiful and that's usually why Hashem put you in it okay that's usually why Hashem put you in it just wants you to take a little break and remember Hello! you know it's me i'm here with you so these are all beautiful realities of life and this is how you have to train yourself now what about if you live without the god consciousness like that's what that's what i'm saying that's what always throws chaos. me like yeah chaos. okay chaos so explain like i'm very interested like i wonder like what is this like here we are like you know you're talking to people and you know everything you say is well you know please god bar -sham, la, 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 and you see that they're kind of looking at you like what language is that? <laughs> right. they, they, I think they live with arrogance. Oh, absolutely. Okay, so that's so interesting. Okay, so Sue really touched on something very, very big. That's the second constant mitzvah. The second constant mitzvah, Hashem says, which is a, it's a hard one, okay? Second constant mitzvah is you shouldn't have any other gods. It's very interesting, the last words, in my presence. You shouldn't have any other gods in my presence. So the Rambam says, like he, he cautions us, like he says, like don't be a, don't be a nar, don't be a fool, and think you shouldn't have any other gods. Means don't make statues and don't bow down to statues. It's you got to really think, okay? You've got to really think, right? You have to believe that you have to realize, like 
the power force, the source is Hashem. It's not you. It's like what Sue said. I, I found this line so incredible. Okay, so I'm gonna tell you the line. This is what describes Jewish history. It says, either we lived with terrible oppression in history, or we live with debilitating wealth. And I found that a very odd statement, like debilitating wealth. Like usually you would never think of the word debilitating and wealth in one sentence, right? You would think, you know, wealth is, most people look at it as very empowering, not debilitating. So what are we looking at as a Jewish nation when we say there's like lots of wealth in the Jewish nation and that becomes debilitating? In which way? Which the way, way that we think we made it. Uh, we think we made it and therefore? Arrogance. Yes, and therefore we don't know God. It. No God. And no Hashem room for God. No room. So it talks about it over and over and over. Like every day in the Shema, it tells you be really, really careful because when you get very fat, you kick, right? Or when you get a lot of wealth, you end up saying, Kohi etzem yadi, asali hazeh. My power and my brains and my everything. That's what made me so wealthy. And it's scary. Like it's scary because sometimes we don't even realize, you know, when you're act, reacting or acting with certain people that you become more afraid of them than Hashem. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You know, like certain people, you're like almost like you give them a little bit too much, you know, like sometimes like every word the doctor says or the donor says or the this says or your boss says and you're like, ah, ah, ah. you know what I mean? So, and it's like in my presence, like, in other words, you're saying you believe in Hashem in your presence, but down deep your emotional reality and the choice you end up making is not really with Amunah and Hashem. Does anybody, you, you get what I'm saying? You're, like, you're more afraid of the person than you are of Hashem and what he really wants you to do, right? And you're like, kind of counting on him you know like you have your job interview and i'm not going to get the job if they don't like me you're not going to get the job if hashem doesn't want you to get the job if hashem wants you to get the job get the job you know what i'm saying and it takes i i think this takes a lot a lot of strength like i i don't think all this stuff is so simple like it's it's called constant for a reason do you know what i mean does anybody else kind of you know you battle with this stuff okay it's very very hard not to think right? Either you think someone else really has the power, or you think you yourself have the power. So it's very interesting, like when you have to say these words, can I, can't I, I can, I can't, you know what I mean? It's very, very interesting. Like, what should be our perspective? Like, I can't do this. I can do this. Like, what is the perspective in the I can and the can'ts of life? With Hashem allows ah, you yes. can help. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's exactly it. And then you can let go and let God. That's what's so good about this. Okay. Because, you know, we, I was talking to Sue, what happens? We do a lot of worry. Why are we so worried? Like I'm being honest. What do we really, let's be real. Why are we so worried? Jody? We're, we, there's no reason we should be worried because it's Hashem who's going to right. To right. do what he needs to what do, he can for do. Us, whether and I really, you know what? Yeah, you know, I was really thinking about it. I was thinking about it lately. Like, I think sometimes we get this whole hishtadless craziness. Also, like we worry, like you're right, God's the one who you know makes it happen. But did I do enough? You know, and it just hit me recently. Like even in fact, right now, I just had an epiphany. Did I do enough? Does Hashem really need you to do enough? No, He could actually make something happen if you did nothing. If you really gave it a try, you gave it a try, period. I don't have to do more than that. I made a couple calls. I gave it a try. Gave it a try. That's all. No, but we have to make a strong effort. We can't. We have to make an effort. But I don't. But, but when you start worrying, you know, when you take it in and you start owning it and it's like, oh, my gosh, and I could have done more. And why didn't I do this? And why didn't I do that? That to me is your Yetzirah's trap. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's and hard because we don't see 
the 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 immediate effect of, of our davening or our, our exactly okay so i thought about it today you know i was actually thinking about it today because i was thinking about like the, like the women are so amazing and they made this rolling whatsapp for tehillim for um for ingrid right okay rolling whatsapp for tehillim for ingrid and i was talking to sue and i was saying you know sue it's like it's heartbreaking because you have to really like what's the word you know, empower yourself, stand tall and say, what I am doing is making a difference. Yes, I'm not Sarah Imenu and I'm not Rachel and I can't ball my eyes out and blah, 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 blah. But I don't have a one-on-one -on -one relationship with Hashem. I'm not a Nabi and I don't have God talking to me. You know what I mean? I'm not setting the foundation of the Jewish people. I am a generation very far and I'm right at the tip. We're at the tip, right? There's 218 years till the year 6,000. We are the last ones crawling. You know, when you're crawling, ah, like holding on like that, that's what we are. Okay. That's what we are. Like, get real with who we are. So whatever we're saying, whatever we're doing, all these lovely ladies who are maybe not so, you know, big doveners now are picking up, you know, a Tehillim and saying Tehillim probably for the first time in a long time, it is shaking the world. So we have to realize we shake the world. We put in a positive energy. We try to direct it to Ingrid, right? Or to whoever. All right. So Hashem says this energy changes things, not only for Ingrid, but changes things all over the world. And it could relieve a little bit of her pain. It could do this. It could do that. It will be, you know, when she goes at 120, it will be big care packages that she will take with her to heaven. Shem will say, you know, Ingrid, because you were such a beloved person, people loved you. There were people who didn't pick up a sitter in 20 years who picked it up for you. Do you know what I'm going to do with that one? On the scale. We have to believe as Jews, like remember 13 principles of faith, you believe in an afterlife. Okay. This is very important. Okay, so you could see. And also that positive energy could fly over to Australia. I know this sounds crazy, where there's a sick person in her bed with a similar sickness to her and actually send positivity to her and help her. Do you know what I mean? And that's what we have to believe. Why do we have to believe it? Because there's countless of stories, countless. You can go online and find a million Amuna stories, millions of stories where people dubbed and did see the results just when they wanted to see it, right? And millions that maybe didn't see it when they wanted to see it, but it went out. Do you know what I mean? So this is something like, this is the situation here. We have to believe in Hashem, and then we have to believe in the belief that Hashem has in us. That what we do matters, and that we do, we do hold the steering wheel. Do you know I mean? In many ways. But such important things. So today, like I was really feeling bad about everything. And then on one of these WhatsApps, it was very interesting. She actually sent a little note. Ingrid, like she, she sent this little note. Thank you so much for everything that people are trying to do. And I sh would like to let you know, I am feeling a little better. And when I got that, I said to me, like myself, like, this is, this is what Hashem wanted. You know what I mean? Like, so that we could like share this, right? You know what I'm saying? So these are the kinds of things that we have to think about. So I want to tell you a Right. You know, sometimes you get these like crazy stories. This is one of the crazy stories. Okay. So Rabbi Fischl Schechter tells the story. It's a story of the past. Okay. This isn't a recent story. This is like way pre-Holocaust story. So um, it's interesting when Jews were living in Poland and at that point, the Poland had a king. Okay. There was a very famous Jewish Orthodox advisor to the king. His name was Rav Shol. I don't, I let if you wait for a minute, I might be able to get to the last name a second. Mm. Rabbi Shol Vale, okay? So his name was Rabbi Shol Vale, and he was the advisor to the king in Poland. So the king in Poland was really not well, and he had no heir to the throne except for a nephew, right? And the nephew, it's a true story, the nephew was in the Alps while this king was really on his deathbed. So in Poland, there was a rule. There could never be a day without a king. So if the king died, you'd hope his son lived in Poland, right? And would be there and would inherit the throne right away. 
but here they had a lapse of time. So they had to wait for this nephew to come back. So let's say all the knights and the, and the royal, whatever, advisors, everybody's fighting their heads off because they all wanted to be the king for the day, all right? They all wanted to be the king before this nephew came. So what did they realize though? Not one of them trusted the other. What didn't they trust? They didn't trust that if the nephew showed up, they would give him the crown. Like once they got onto the seat, right? Like they wouldn't want to get off, which makes a lot of sense, okay? So they're discussing who could be that one day king. So who did they decide? This rabbi, <laughs> okay? This is a true story. So they crowned this, they asked him first, and here's why they decided him. Not because they thought he would be so honest that he'd get off, but he would know that Poland would never let a Jew be a king, okay? Like, he'd be lucky if he lived the 24 hours, all right? So they knew that he would understand he's given away this king thing. So when he sat down on the throne, he took the job, and everybody was very surprised that he was willing to take it, because you can imagine there's a lot of risks and espionage and all this kind of stuff that could happen. He took it, and the minute he took it, what did he do? He started signing all these decrees to lessen all the oppression on the Jews. So, like, the Jews had a special tax just for being Jewish, okay? You know, like, there was all kinds of horrible things that were happening to the Jews, and he's signing all this stuff, and they're like, Oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, they, they didn't realize he would actually do something, all right? And then, you know, Bar Hashem, the nephew comes and he hands him the throne. Fine. Okay, so then the nephew says to this guy, like the guy, like Rabbi Shol says, you know, Rabbi Scholl says, okay, you know, I'm so happy for you. You should have a long, wonderful kingdom and I'm on my way out. He goes, no, 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 no. You cannot leave. You were the advisor for my uncle. I need you, okay? I'm taking over this you know, Poland, I have no idea what's going on. You can't afford to leave. So he says, what's the things on our agenda? So he said, well, one of the things on your agenda is the king left a, a daughter, all right? So best thing you could do is get that daughter married as fast as possible, right? So there isn't more, you know, tearing up the kingdom. So the guy goes, great, do you have a son? To the rabbi. The true story. So the rabbi's like, oh no. <laughs> He goes, I, you know, I have one son. So he goes, great. He should marry that girl. So she goes, what are you talking, your highness? It's like, my son is a Jew. You know, she's a non-Jew. She's a Christian. You would never do this. No one would stand for that. He goes, what are you talking about? We're going to baptize your son. What's the big deal? We'll baptize your son. What's the big deal? I'll let him do whatever he wants, you know, behind closed doors, but he'll become one of us. And he's brilliant. And this is the best idea ever. And this is what we're doing. And if not, off with your head. You know how it is. Like, it's not like you have a lot of Bechira here. Okay, so he runs home. Like, this rabbi runs home. He tells the son, his name's Mayor. And Mayor says, absolutely not. Like, we're not going to do this. And he, of course, we're not going to do this. And they're thinking, what can they do? So the only thing that they can do is get that son married. Because in Poland, this, you know, royalty cannot marry. You know, you're not, like, even till today, really, they're not supposed to be marrying anyone who is divorced, right? Okay, I think that's a, a common rule. So... Now you need a shidduch in two seconds, <laughs> okay? So we're gonna find a shidduch in two seconds. Like this isn't an easy story. So they're looking all over, they can't find any girl. And then they hear about this girl who's on her deathbed, okay? So they run to this girl who's on her deathbed and they say, before you die, would you like to do one last mitzvah? And she's like, what, what, what mitzvah? Would you marry my son? And like to explain the story, she goes, yes. Okay, so they give her a ring. She's in the deathbed. There's a chuppah like holding over this death. That's a true story. And she ends up marrying this guy. Okay, fine. So the kid, the kid, the nephew comes, you know, the new king with the with his with the old kings, with his cousin, I guess, with his cousin, and wants to do the shidduch. And then Rabbi Shaul says, you know, I'm really sorry, but my son got married. Like, I, I, he, he was in betrothed, and by the time I got home and blah, 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 he got married. So they didn't kill him because I think he needed him as an advisor. So that was that. Fine. So he had his own place in the palace, this Rabbi Shal Dale. He has this place in the palace, and there's like a knock at the door, and his like shamish, right, opens the door, and he says to him, listen, you know, there's somebody here. There's a woman here to see you. Okay, so this is like, you know, weeks in, there's a woman here to see you. So he says, listen, I'm, you know, just tell her, I can't see her because um, like these, these are, I have certain hours. These are my off hours. I have to work for the king. I can't. 
And he goes, no, no, she's really adamant. She's actually very, very angry. And she keeps telling me that she's your daughter-in-law. So he goes, I don't know what you're talking about. No, she's telling me she's your daughter-in-law. All right, all right, let her in. So he comes, she comes in and she was that woman. She recovered. Okay, so here she recovered. This is a true story, all right? So she recovers and she says to the, she says to this rabbi, I would like my husband now. <laughs> and he's like, what? <laughs> like, that was just a little quickie thing, you know? <laughs> that wasn't really real, you know? Like, you know, we're very hush a family. We have yichus, you know, yichus is like a, what's yichus? A pedigree, right? We have a pedigree. So she goes, so do I, I am the niece of, of a very um, renowned rabbi, he was a very renowned rabbi. And he was the one who wrote the Shulchan Aruch and his, the, for the Litvish community, his name was Rav Meir Islis. He was a very like hush of guy. So he goes, yeah, but I rem like, you're a lot older than my son, <laughs> okay? <laughs> like, you're like 15 years older. She goes, I don't think you understand. If this happened, Hashem wanted it to happen. You understand that this is Bashar, don't you? He goes, well, no. Like, and he started saying, like, do you know what I'm saying? Like here, like, these are great people, but when it isn't what you want and you think you are in control, you don't think that this is Hashem, okay? So she said, but it is Hashem. You understand this was Hashem. Let's go together to the great Rav Islis. Like, and he was renowned. So after a lot of thinking and like prodding, like he kept saying, you're not going to have children. You're 15 years older. This is my only son. I really want to have grandchildren. She kept repeating it over and over. This is from Hashem. So they went in front of the great rabbi. Okay, so the great rabbi said like this, you know what? Number one, they have to stay. They have to stay together. This is from Hashem. This whole story was from Hashem. There's no reason to not go through with this shidduch. She's a, a very good person. So she's 15 years older. Don't worry, I give you a bracha that you should have twins. In some ways, I wish Esther was here because he changed their last name to Tamim. And I think Sarah's partner's last name is Tamim. <laughs> Isn't it? So it means twins, okay? So this couple... They had a boy and a girl, and this boy and girl between the two of them had like 24 sets of twins. <laughs> okay. And it's like this astronomical number of twins between these two people. And Lamaisa, they say till today, like there's many people around the world with the last name Tamim, and they're related to this one family. But the point of the story is just something to see. You know, everything in life is Bashirt when it's easy for you or when it's what you want it to be, Bashert, you know? Like it was Bashert, I got to be the king for the day. It's Bashert, I got to, you know, take away all these decrees. It's Bashert that I got my son off the hook. But just like that was Bashert, so was the fact that he was betrothed to that girl. And just like she ended up coming off her deathbed and was also Bashert, and that she was healthy was also Bashert, and that she wanted to stay married was also Bashert. And there really was no reason to give her a get. Do you see what I'm saying? Like, this is why it's constant, right? But I think personally, we have a gift. And I think personally, if any of us opened our eyes, like when you read that beautiful story, you know, of the Holocaust Remembrance Day in Germany, if you really opened your eyes, you would see for sure there's only Hashem. There's only Hashem. Why he's orchestrating a lot of craziness right now, I think it's because, and I know people have said it a hundred times, millions of times, but now we're coming to the dead end. Okay? <laughs> you know, when you're driving down the street, you sometimes think you could turn this way, turn this way, turn this way, and then it says dead end, and you don't really believe them. But as you're really getting close, you realize it is a dead end. So that's what I think is happening. I think Mashiach is coming. And the greatest test before Mashiach will come, I'm going to tell you now, is hang on tight. And you're going to have to hang on tight with your Amuna. Like, you know, it was funny. Sue, are you there? 
So like last night on Saturday night, my husband was doing, I'm just going to say quickly, my husband was going through like Daniel had this amazing prophecy. The prophet Daniel had his prophecy. And at the end, it was very, very confusing. And the, all the rabbis are calculating. What is it talking about? Is it talking about the end of days? Is it talking about the story of Hanukkah? Is it talking about the last? It was the first time I ever heard that the last exile is with the Arabs will be Ishmael. You know what I mean? Like, is it this? Is it that? Is it that? When, when's it going to happen? And then and lists all these great rabbis, Rav Sajjah Gaon and the Rashi, who said, Mashiach is going to come in this year. Right? And he never does. And they say it's like the potential. Like, there's like a potential that, you know, Hashem is going to open up and give you that extra little boost. But the Jewish people didn't take it. Like it was very interesting. It's like Hashem says, I will send the Jewish people Mashiach, but he'll only come if they cry for him. So sometimes Hashem makes the world nutso so that we will cry for him. Because we don't remember. We totally don't remember. We don't remember. We try to, you know, I'm going to just lift my hand up. It's a big deal. You know what I mean? And then Hashem says, no, we're going to have to remember who's the power source behind all this. Do you know what I mean? So Mirza Hashem, we should remember in good ways. Let's like, Hashem, yeah, like we're going to notice because all the beautiful miracles and the Yeshuas and all the good things that you brought and all the stuff that we have that we're not going to take for granted. And we're going to really give credit where credit is due. So we don't end up serving the stupid God called self who really is far from perfect. You know what I mean? So that's what I'm, I'm, you know, hoping. And that's what this means for this six constant mitzvahs. And now, you know, like, don't feel badly. You know, some days you'll feel this way. Some days you'll feel that way. That's your mitzvah. The tension is your mitzvah, right? And the choice is your, is your gift, right? And then you build your egg, you know, your nest of air miles to heaven. And it's amazing. Okay. So if anybody have any questions, anything you want to ask? Are we all good? Okay, so I just love you all. Okay, <laughs> thank you so much for coming. So, so tomorrow, what's, yes, Amita, what's your, yes. Yafa's, what's Yafa's last your mother's okay, name? But Yafa, everyone should Yochavet. be happy. Thank you so much. Yafa Bas Yochavet. And Wednesday night, we're going to do an Omein night. So like, I really think that like, we'll do an Omein night for everything. And I, I think it's good because it puts everything in perspective and, and helps us dive in for others and ourselves and all the things that we need. And tomorrow I'll send, I'll send this text, uh, this tape out and I'll try to send it with that um you know the nice thing about the holocaust story mm -hmm. and what else and tomorrow night is Krishma alamita and let's try to move through it okay all right does it does it help people like i found like yes. my yeah i found it much better to thank hashem okay good night everybody really all night. the best thank, thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. thank you thank you thank you thank you